Good morning, how are we doing today? This is James Sweeney, aka Split Soup. Welcome back to another video. In today's video, we review a hand sent in by Andrew. This is a hand from Live25 with a 1K max buy in. And without further ado, let's check it out. So, in this spot, there's a limp, there's a raise, folds to us, and here just decides to call. So, let's talk about it from here. So in Andrew's write-up about this hand, Andrew says this, The solid rag has been isolating limpers pretty often from late position, so I'm flatting the big blind with a pretty playable hand. Middle position has been limp calling a lot too. I feel the call prefop is pretty standard. So I want to talk about this for a moment because I think this is a really important start of the hand. So we have the solid rag in the cutoff who's isolating, totally standard, has been doing that a lot during the session, also starts with 200 big blinds, okay, awesome. And then we have the passive-ish rag, by the way, love that description, and this person has been doing a decent amount of limb calling prefop. But the fact that they're qualified as reg, even if they're passive-ish, whatever, just means that they're probably not going to be dumping off a ton, prefop nor postfop right? Especially someone who's doing a limp calling prefop, probably not someone who's going to be like completely spewy post flop with like bottom or middle pair. Yeah, they play a little passive prefop, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be ultra, ultra spewy. So I don't think there's going to be like a huge source of implied odds from either of these players. Now, people will flat with ace-10 here. They're flat with king-queen off here. They're flat with ace-jack here. They're flat with all these kind of hands that are pretty, that they definitely want to play, but they don't want to three-bet. And what I would want to challenge Hero to do, and, and what Andrew to think about specifically, and you when you find yourself in similar situations, is definitely consider the three-bet. Now, there's a couple different reasons why. Again, first, if we do decide to call, where are the implied odds? Where are we really making money? Or are we just setting ourselves up for some really, really tricky situations. If you've never thought about that before, pause the video, think about that for the next 30 seconds and see what you come up with. I assure you, it might be a little different than what you thought was quote unquote, the standard default thing to do here. Okay, once we're beyond talking about the upside of flatting, sure, passive-ish reg probably isn't going to 3-bet you very much, so you're going to see a lot of flops, but great, you're out of position, pot 75 bucks, you don't have like the deepest SPR in the world, you're kind of sitting there around like 11, 12-ish, okay, fine, there's certainly enough playability to go forward, but what are you going to do? Do you love when it comes 10x? Do you love when it comes ace -X? How sticky are you planning on being? Are you calling off, you know, a buy-in with top pair? What are you really going to be doing in that scenario? Again, how is post flop going to pan out? How is that going to be profitable? How is that going to show an edge for you? Conversely, think about three betting. What does three betting do? Three betting probably gets the passive-ish reg to fold a lot. Okay, fine. But chances are you haven't been three betting very often. So it's, is the solid reg really going to give you like heaps and heaps of action? Sure, we're playing deep, so maybe he decides to call a little bit more, but is he really going to go crazy post flop, especially if he hasn't seen you three bet very much? So it's a situation where sure, maybe he calls with more hands like ace jack and queen jack suited and hands like that. But is he really going to go bonkers post flop with, you know, high cards? Well, he's going to have that a large chunk of the time. So again, think about how that's going to pan out. Another thing is thinking about the overall dynamic. If you start three betting here, what are you telling the solid reg over the duration of the session? Are you telling him, hey, you should apply a lot of pressure every time I'm in the blinds and you want to attack limpers? Or are you sending the message of, hey, it's not going to be so easy every single time you want to try to pick up pots preflop. So if he starts getting out of those pots, now leaves an opportunity for you to start taking advantage of those pots. So again, we're not just looking at like this single Single hand, we're also thinking about how this line and how our aggression is going to shape and mold the entire session. It might be a little more of a thought process than you've ever put into situations like this, but I assure you, if you can start thinking about sessions as kind of like oceans where there's all these waves and you can determine, okay, which wave is going to be best for me to ride on and how can me being on a wave take away from someone else's wave, I assure you it's a little meta, but it's also going to be really, really beneficial for your growth in the long run. So to Andrew's point in the write-up where he says, I feel the call prefop is pretty standard, I agree with you. I think most people would do this. I think it is a typical standard safe thing to do, but I don't think it's best. I think exploring the three bet here is going to be way more valuable than most people give a credit for. And I think that if you start doing some of that exploration, even just light thinking on it off session, it will allow you to find these kind of situations in session much, much, much more easily. But anyway, as played, we end up calling passive-ish reg calls as well, not shocking, go three-way to it, go here, here decides to check, check, face a c-bet of almost pot, and here just decides to call. 
So this is actually a pretty cool hand with a decent chunk of inflection points that are quite interesting. So in this scenario here, just decides to check call, but one of the things I would think about is, could we check raise here, right? Would check raising to 240, 250 be something of interest? Would it get a job done? What would it accomplish? What would the solid reg do? That sort of thing. And I think it would be pretty tough to do so super, super profitably, just because what is the solid reg really gonna be like C betting here almost for pot and then like going away with? right? So I don't think there's heaps of fold equity and sure we could get a lot of money in when we have a decent chunk of equity, but we're always going to be equity dogs and there's not enough overlay to make this worthwhile in my opinion. So this is one of those things that I would have asked myself before I even made my flop decision, right? So before, when I'm, as soon as I'm here, I ask myself, okay, would a check raise be good? Yes or no. And then I also ask myself, would a lead be good here? Yes or no. Would just betting here be fine? Or would check raising be more profitable? Or would check calling be more profitable? Again, looking at all the lines in front of us and thinking about which one is going to be best. Now, I don't love check raising in this scenario. I just don't think the stack sizes are right for it. I don't think the ranges are going to be right for it. And as such, I don't want a check raise. So that leaves me to check and then call because I'm certainly not going to check fold and then or I could just lead. Now, again, when you're exploring hands off table, this is what I want you to be doing. Even if it's a situation where like you're, you've never led before. It's just something you've never even thought about. You've never even done. You always check when you're the preflop passive person. Okay. But when you're doing off table exploration and analysis, at least take a moment and say, wait, could that be good? What would that do? Is that profitable? Is that better? And then make some decisions from there. And the more you do that off table, the easier in real time it is to actually find lines that may be atypical for your overall, either your playbook or your player pools playbook as a whole. In this situation, I really like leading. I lead here for 50 and just kind of play out, and I'd be leading here with a lot of hands, and I'm also planning on leading and applying a lot of pressure if I face a raise, especially from the solid reg. But that's just kind of my overall idea in this scenario. I like that a lot better than trying to go for a check raise, and check call, eh, not my favorite play in the world either. So as played, we do decide to check call. The passive-ish reg actually shows up with a check raise and the solid reg decides to fold. Now, at first glance, I looked at this and I said, well, passive-ish reg, probably gonna be check raising with a pretty strong range of hands. And as such, if I decide to three bet, is there really any fold equity? So let's talk about that for a moment. So whenever I'm in a spot like this, I always ask myself, first and foremost, how many like really strong power nutted combos are possibly in here? Now, deuces make sense for the passive-ish reg, but I don't think queens and nines make sense because if the passive-ish reg had pocket queens or pocket nines, are they really gonna take that preflop line of limp call Right, if they wanted to do something trappy, maybe they went for a limp re-raise, maybe they just open raise themselves. I mean, I don't think queens and nines are gonna be in here a very large chunk of the time unless you've seen it, you have some information that'll really lead you that way. So for this moment, I'm gonna delete pocket queens and pocket nines, which leaves three combos of sets. And I think that if the passive-ish reg has queen nine, it's gonna be queen nine suited, and there's three combos of that. Okay, so five combos of power. Great, let's compare that to other possible combinations of hands. Well, Jack-10 could take this line, okay. There are other heart combinations, including King-Jack of hearts, and also, of course, you know, maybe King and hearts probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but there's probably gonna be like suited connectors that we don't block, right? Like seven, eight of hearts, and five, six of hearts, and maybe gappers, like eight, six of hearts. So all of a sudden you can start throwing in all these combinations of second best hands, right? And hands that you smoke and absolutely annihilate. So the more that I look at this, the more that I'm thinking, wait, wait, wait. Sure, he's passive-ish, but does he only have five combos of the nut? nutish kind of hands here or is this the kind of dude who is not going to be showing up with a ton of that stuff and now all of a sudden he's left with a lot of hands that we do super super well against and even if this dude's getting like king queen all in well again is a passive-ish reg really going to do that maybe maybe not but i don't think that we need to be super super concerned here so because of that not a lot of strong combos lots and lots of combos that we actually do pretty well against even if they're shaded right even if you think that he would sometimes check call them and sometimes check raise them, I think this is a beautiful scenario just to punt the rest of it in and actually end up in a very, very profitable situation. You can use a fold equity calculator if you want to proof it, but at an eyeball's glance, this looks pretty darn good to me. 
Now, Hero does decide to just call here, and, you know, we're getting okay price, not the best one in the world, but calling again puts you in kind of an awkward situation. So we have a situation here where Andrew decided to take a call line preflop, create an awkward situation, check call flop, put himself in an awkward situation, and now is calling a check raise on the flop, putting himself into another awkward situation. Now, that's not to say that every single time that we call that we're always going to find ourselves in an awkward and possibly suboptimal spot, but I'd say this is something that Andrew would definitely want to look at in his game, and this is probably something that you want to look at in your game as well. Now, sure, we're looking at it through a very specific lens of this exact hand, but definitely look at that if you're constantly finding yourself in spots where you're taking more of the passive kind of, uh, yeah, just passive approach that's, you know, not super aggressive, and really ask yourself, is that serving you as best as it possibly could? Now, in this scenario, we end up improving on the turn, although it does board pair, but again, I'm not worried about pocket queens, not worried about pocket nines. There is now one combination of deuces, which makes quads, and as such, I don't care. So I just want to get a lot of money in here, and really the question is, do we check and allow the passivish rag to continue betting? If the passivish rag is bluffing with something like Jack-10, is he really going to continue firing at this point, or is he going to take more of the, the passive approach? So in this scenario, Hero decides to check, and while checking I think is pretty standard, I think a lot of people will do it, I'd actually much prefer to see a donk just lead it out here. Andrew actually suggested that as well in his write-up that he thought that leading would be better here, and I definitely agree. I think if you lead here for like 250, 275, rest in on the river, you get a much more profitable scenario. And I think you guarantee that money starts going in rather than checking and allowing him to, you know, start playing scared, start playing more passive and putting yourself in a situation where you just leave money on the table. So unfortunately, the reg does end up checking on the turn. River ends up putting up the fourth heart. Okay, obviously we're, we're pretty pretty comfortable with our hand at this point, and here decides to lead for 260. So barring the fact that I never really get here like this, let's still explore the situation nonetheless, because sometimes we find ourselves in weird spots, and it's important that we know how to dig ourselves out. So if we go back here, we have roughly a pot size bet going into the river. And the question that I would kind of ask myself is, would shoving get me looked up by second best? And then if not, what bet size is going to be better in this situation? So essentially, like if the passivish reg somehow found himself here with the king of hearts, what number would I have to give him? If he found himself here with like seven, eight of hearts, what number would I have to give him? So I'm going to let you in on a little secret when it comes to bet sizing. And this is just kind of numbers that I've come up with through economics classes, but also just through experience in the game. When you're playing live, especially, there are some very, very important numbers to be aware of when it comes to people's kind of psychology of bet sizes and numbers. So 100 is a major number, 200 is a major number, 500 is a major number, and 1,000 is a major number. Notice that nowhere in there did I say 300, 400, $379, or $642 was a major number. So what I mean by that is once you kind of cross the $200 threshold, between 200 and 500, you get a lot of kind of non-pain, right? Once someone has decided I'm going to call at least 200, th usually there's a number between like 200 and 500 and most of those numbers they're going to be fairly comfortable with, especially when all of those numbers are underneath the size of the pot. Once you then get to 500, now all of a sudden you're in this new pain point and you have to estimate whether or not they're going to give that action. So again, bearing with me, there's a little psychology here, there's a little economics here, but that's where we are right this moment. So what I mean by that is we're obviously going to be betting more than 200 here a pretty large chunk of the time, right? More than third pot. So my question is, what's the number between 200 and 500? Because I don't think I can shove here and get looked up by really anything other than what deuces and any weird thing that somehow beats us and maybe the king of hearts gives us action, but I don't even see that happening 100% of the time. So I'm trying to find a number that gets me looked up by second best enough. And I think that 260 is pretty similar to 320 and pretty similar to something like 385. I think a lot of those numbers are going to be treated very, very similarly in terms of how I get action from them. So because of that, I think only going 260 leaves money on the table. I think we could easily bet as large as like up to around 400. And probably if our opponent does decide they want to give action with their hand, they're going to be fairly inelastic in that range. Again, sub 500, definitely over 200. We 
we've already surpassed that pain point and now we're on to the next one so again there's a th this hand kind of got way deeper than i was originally anticipating there's a lot of things in here that need to get unpacked but once you can start understanding and kind of digesting a lot of these nuggets i think it's going to help you a ton if nothing else give you a ton of stuff to study and think about off table and then of course turn that into real table thought process but there's a lot of things in here to look at so andrew i really appreciate this hand thank you so much for for sending it in and also for the interesting write-up but this is just a scenario where again i think you kind of misplayed a bunch of different streets here and i think the bet size on the river also leaves something to be desired looking at just general economics and price psychology so in this scenario, Passivish Reg does decide to call fine. We don't end up seeing their cards. They muck, we win. Awesome, awesome. But again, I think a lot of money was left on the table here. And I think a lot of different inflection points here could have been played differently and also much more profitably. So that's going to wrap it up for this video. Andrew, thank you so much for this hand. Hopefully this helps you the next time you find yourself in a similar situation. And for anyone watching, I really hope this is helping you understand some things you need to be thinking about both on and off the table, some things you need to be exploring so that way you can take more optimal lines in the future. If you're looking for your what's next, your next step is to improve your three bet pots. Now, again, this entire hand really boiled back to the fact that we just flatted as opposed to three betting. Now, most people simply don't three bet often enough. And Usually that's because they don't feel comfortable with the pot pre-flop, but especially don't feel comfortable with it post-flop. And I want to fix that for you. So I have an entire series that I'd invite you to check out. It's called Playing 3-Bet Pots. It's my series available on my site, splitsuit.com. Just go to the shop and you'll see it right in there. And it's really going to help you navigate 3-Bet Pots, both pre-flop and post-flop. And when you have that confidence, when you have that knowledge, that technical ability, you're not going to hesitate to pull the trigger pre-flop, even with hands you would have flatted with in the past. So again, you can check that out at splitsuit.com go to the shop look for the plain three bet pot series and check it out and let me know what you think same as always if you have any comments or questions please don't hesitate to let me know otherwise as always good luck out there and happy grinding